from, it's more than a little quote, but a bit of a quote from uh, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher, early 1700s, considered one of the great theologians of, of America, a missionary to the uh, uh, American uh, Indians, and uh, he was such an eloquent preacher, and of course in those days they literally uh, wrote out their sermons and then read them and delivered them, uh, and um, up until just about um, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, his sermons were studied in our public schools because they were so powerful and because they were considered part of classic American literature. Everybody studied them as they went through the public schools uh, in this country. That no longer is, uh, is the case, but Jonathan Edwards says this, because uh, our first point is there's going to be opposition to the kingdom, and it's going to come by um, imitating. Jesus says, Satan will imitate what I'm doing. Jonathan Edwards says this about this idea. He says, it should always be noted that the more excellent something is, the more likely it will be uh, imitated. There are many false diamonds and rubies, but who goes about making counterfeit pebbles? However, the more excellent things are the more difficult to imitate them in their essential character and intrinsic virtues. Yet the more veritable the limitations that be, the more skill and subtly will be used in making them an exact uh, imitation. So it is with Christian virtues and graces. The devil and men's own deceitful hearts tend to imitate those things that have the highest value. So no graces are more counterfeited than love and humility, for these are the virtues where the beauty of a true Christian is seen most clearly." The gospel of the kingdom of God is imitated because it is of the highest value. I like that line, who makes imitation pebbles. <laughs> There's probably somebody out there that does these days. But, uh, uh, but again, it's those things that are of the highest value, the highest virtue that are, uh, that are copied. And that's what we're going to see in our opening parable. We're going to read verses 24 to 43, and, and again, this first point is there'll be opposition to the kingdom. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted, it formed heads. Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered. Because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables, he did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. The disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. 
He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Uh, the first thing that we notice uh, about these is there is a direct connection in all of them. He begins by, uh, by saying, uh, and he told them another parable. And, uh, and again, in the Greeks, it means another of the same kind. These are all joined together. Uh, several times, if you look through, he'll say uh, phrases like, and again, or once again, because it all ties together. These are all parables of the same kind that all go together uh, about, the, uh, about the kingdom of God. I took great solace in the fact that Jesus uses the word again several times repetitively as I have a tendency to do that myself, as you may have noticed. Like I say, now I can say, well, hey, Jesus did it. I may never be able to break that, but it's okay now. There will be, uh, first thing we notice is that there'll be counterfeit Christians. Uh, kingdom of God is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. The enemy comes, and notice it's while they were sleeping, so we're uh, totally unaware. Christians, people in the church, pastors, church leaders are unaware of exactly when this is taking place. Uh, apparently, it's while everyone sleeps. Um, when the wheat sprouted, so did the, the weeds, and the servants are certainly uh, concerned uh, and they say, hey, how did this happen? And he explains that actually it's the, the devil came and then sowed these sons of the evil one uh, in while everyone was sleeping. Now, uh, the word that he uses for weeds is sometimes the normal word there. Uh, King James, New King James is tares. Uh, it's a type of a weed that looks exactly like wheat. They look exactly the same as they're growing up. And until the wheat produces its head and out comes the grain, that's the only time you can tell. It's right at the end, right before it gets harvested. So the whole time that this is going on, you cannot distinguish between the two. Therefore, uh, Jesus says to them, uh, no, don't go pull them out now. The, at the end of the age, uh, before the, the great white throne judgment, at that time, the angels will come uh, and they'll be the ones that actually do the, uh, the separating. And, uh, and of course, there's... Uh, uh, the consequences of those that are either, again, in these parables, there's no neutral ground. Nobody's kind of a Christian, you know. Nobody's kind of saved or almost saved. Uh, they're either saved and they're the son of God and they will be taken with him uh, at the end or they're the son of the devil and they will face the consequences of, of eternal judgment. And, uh, and this same language carries through all these parables. Somebody had said at one point in time, well, that's just symbolic language. Um, yeah, but that doesn't let anybody off the hook because uh, symbolic language is always a, a, a lesser degree than the, than the reality in every language, in every language that uses symbolic language. That's the same. So if you choose not to believe that people will burn forever and ever in the fires of hell, then know that it's going to be worse than that. It's not going to be, those, those are the only two, uh, two options here. Certainly, part of this is to help us kind of have a, a sober view of, uh, of uh, sharing the gospel. Again, this is following the sower on the seed. The power is in the seed, but still somebody's got to uh, deliver the, the goods. Now, uh, I want to make reference to what Jesus had said previously uh, about this idea of uh, uh, in the kingdom of God, there are those that are really saved and, in, in, in a, and those that appear to be saved that are, that are not. Seems to be a, a big concern uh, of Jesus. In Matthew 7, 21, there he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And, and of course, the will of the Father is to receive uh, Jesus um, as the Messiah. Uh, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, uh, you evildoers. 
So in the kingdom of God, as it grows, as it expands, uh, there are those that are actually really saved and, uh, and churches that, uh, that uh, hold to the truth of the word of God. Uh, there's going to be those uh, through the ages that um, appear to be Christian and are not, or claim to be Christians that are not. They actually will have leaders, according to that passage in Matthew 7, 21, that actually prophesy in his name, do miracles in his name, but they weren't. And Jesus, in the end, to them individually, he'll say, away from me, uh, I never knew you. Um, so the bottom line is there's going to be, in the kingdom of God, it's spread individually by other individuals, sowing the good seed, uh, the power is in, in the word of God. As we looked at uh, last week, we're not redeemed, uh, again, by silver or gold, by the precious blood of Christ. Uh, and there are going to be those that hold to the truth. At the same time, there's going to be those that imitate uh, the truth. Certainly, he wants us to be aware of that and be concerned about that. So there will be one counterfeit Christians. Secondly, uh, in the second parable, there's counterfeit growth. Uh, Jesus said that the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed which was planted uh, in a field. And uh, I've never seen a mustard seed, but I'm, I'm told that what even you pluck off the tree that looks like the seed, that looks pretty small, that if you crush it and break it, in that, that's just the, the, uh, the pod, and in that are the seeds, and they're even smaller. The whole point in, uh, uh, in uh, Jesus' day and age, it just meant this is like the most insignificant seed you could possibly come up with. Uh, and that's how the kingdom of God, that's how the church is going to begin. And yet it grows. And again, a, a mustard seed would normally grow into a, a bush, not necessarily a tree. I mean, it might grow into enough of a bush that, you know, it's kind of like a tree, but it's not a tree. But this mustard seed grows into a tree. Uh, therefore, we, we say that uh, within the kingdom of God, at some point in time, there's going to be some kind of abnormal growth that, uh, that takes place. Uh, passages like Daniel 4.12, Ezekiel 17.23 indicate that the tree, at least in the Old Testament, is a symbol of, of world power. So apparently the church, though it starts off very insignificant, nobody would think anything of it, these 12 guys that are going to start out uh, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that somehow there's tremendous abnormal growth. It be actually becomes some kind of a world power. Uh, the other thing about this particular illustration is that it becomes so large in this abnormal growth that birds of the air are able to come and land in it. And here I want to make reference to the parallel passage in Mark, uh, in Mark 4.13. And again, he's, Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower and the seed. And he says, uh, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? That's Mark 4.13. So apparently we need to understand the symbolism uh, in that parable. And in that parable, the birds that came were, remember, they came and plucked the seed that was on the hard ground, the pathways, and then Jesus identifies them as being Satan. So apparently a point in time in the church, in the kingdom of God, it's going to start out so insignificant, these 12 guys that have witnessed the, uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ along with um, uh, the, the hundreds that... Uh, were there on particular occasions, and uh, within a very short period of time, uh, the, uh, the enemies of Christ would say, and they've turned the world upside down. We see that in the book, book of Acts. What happens after the book of Acts, though, the church does go through an abnormal growth period of time. So abnormal that under Constantine, again, the Roman emperor, all persecution ends, which, you know, it could be a, a good thing, uh, but then uh, through, uh, again, subsequent Roman rulers, the church is now merged with the state, and it becomes an incredibly powerful state and, uh, and political formation. And, uh, and one of the uh, things that they would attempt to do uh, as they would go out intentionally uh, with the gospel is to try to blend it in or morph it in or adopt into it cultural applications wherever they went. So the church began to look very different in very different cultures. Uh, and therefore you have, uh, if they, they have a, uh, the, uh, the summer sol solstice or if, uh, that they worship and so forth, uh, it's, or it's springtime, then, then we'll use that and have a big celebration. We'll call it Easter or, you know, after the, the goddess 
uh, Easter, or we say Easter today. Uh, we'll, we'll develop a, a time of day during the uh, celebration in the winter uh, when we, they have their big pagan celebrations, and, and we'll adopt that in, and we'll, we'll say that's the time of the birth of Christ, and we'll have a big celebration. So they begin to uh, morph these things into other cultures. Uh, tremendous abnormal growth in this church state then becomes basically runs Europe for the next, you know, thousand, thousand years. Incredible abnormal growth, like a mustard seed that comes in the, so large that the birds of the air can come and land right within it. And if we stay with the symbolism of the first parable, then the birds of the air represent Satan himself, able to come in doctrinally by practice and, uh, and, and so forth. Again, we can have uh, uh, here counterfeit Christians, uh, counterfeit growth. Uh, and then we also have a warning of counterfeit doctrine in the third parable. This is a woman that took um, and mixed a, a large amount of flour and uh, mixed uh, yeast into it. Now, uh, again, it's interesting that uh, in the end, when the disciples get along with Jesus, they, they only ask about the first parable. Uh, I think they kind of get it, the, the other two apparently uh, in this one, they would as well, being Jewish, because yeast is always a symbol of, of evil or sin. That's why at Passover, you have to go through your whole house and pull off all the cushion covers and look all around and make sure there's no yeast left in, in the house. It's a symbol of sin. It's where we get our idea of spring cleaning. They did it for, uh, for Passover. Uh, Jesus used it as a picture of hypocrisy in Luke 12. He used it as an example of false teaching in Matthew 16. He uses it as a, a type of worldly compromise in Matthew 22. Paul uses it as a picture of the carnality in the church in 1 Corinthians and of false doctrines in Galatians 5. And the idea is that a little yeast can work its way through the whole thing. And it seems to be quietly uh, uh, under the scene. But what it's doing, it's uh, basically corrupting things. So in the kingdom of God... It's, it's going to go out like a farmer sowing seed. Uh, not everybody is going to come to faith in Christ. The worries and the cares of this life are going to uh, keep people from coming to know Jesus Christ. There's, there's basically a, a satanic influence, uh, and the devil is certainly involved in preventing people from coming to faith in Christ. And we mentioned last week the need to, to prayer because uh, Paul says that the God of this age has blinded people that prevents them from coming to faith in Christ. Add to that now, there's going to be opposition. And certainly there would be opposition in terms of persecution that's outward uh, that we see in the book of Acts that is still very prevalent in the world today. But there's another uh, thing that's even more insidious, and that is there's going to be a, an imitation of Christians and churches that grow up right alongside uh, the true church and the true teaching of the Word of God. There's going to be some abnormal growth at some point in time uh, that is, ends up being a real deterrent because it becomes such a large corporate kind of world power that uh, it becomes kind of corrupted in a sense and loses a sight of the simplicity of, of the gospel. And then add to that, it's also like yeast that works its way through uh, that uh, brings about hypocrisy and false teaching and, uh, and false doctrine and all this should be a, a very much a, a sober warning to us. Uh, again, in the New Testament, Paul says he has counterfeit Christians in 2 Corinthians who believe a counterfeit gospel in Galatians 1. Uh, he encourages a, a counterfeit righteousness according to Romans 10. Eventually, there'll be a counterfeit church in Re Revelation 2. And eventually, Satan will present a counterfeit Messiah uh, that we refer to as the Antichrist. So very, very interesting and kind of sobering these, uh, these parables. Now, uh, so point one, there'll be opposition to the kingdom. As I kind of went through and, and, and thought about this, it's like, <laughs> well, what do you, Zach, what do you do about this? You know, and I, I like Warren Wiersbe lines. He says, well, God didn't call us to be detectives, but to be evangelists. So we just need to keep about the master's business and sowing those seeds and, and going about. And in the end, it's going to be obvious, you know, who's with us and who's against us and uh, all those kinds of things. Yet at the same time in the New Testament and with Jesus, he warns us several times to have discernment. Uh, and to be able to judge, you know, false doctrine from correct doctrine. And that's a real concern and it's a real warning. And, and certainly uh, what Paul has so much to say and Peter is that in the last days, that's going to get worse in terms of false teaching and so forth. 
try to balance that with, with everything the church, uh, that Jesus says about uh, unity and having unity, not only in the Old Testament, but in the, the New Testament. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, he's praying for our unity. So, so how do you balance this idea of, uh, of unity, but realizing that there is a corrupting influence in, 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 the, in the church worldwide, uh, as well as uh, there seems to be a false gospel that's, uh, that's out there. I wanted to uh, read a couple of things from you, or for you, and, and one is from uh, Joseph Stahl. Joseph Stahl is a great author, a great preacher, and for a period of time uh, ran uh, Moody Bible Institute, held many, many other distinguished positions. But uh, this is one of his latest books from the, from the front lines, and uh, I just wanted to read a bit because he addresses this issue of of uh, unity, which we're to strive for, but how do we balance that, realizing that there is deception out there. There's an enemy who's going to try to uh, imitate everything there is about Christ and about the gospel. He says, it gives me serious pause when I read in the scriptures, there are six things that the Lord hates. In fact, seven that are um, an abomination to him. The final item on the list of behaviors abominable to the Lord is someone who sows discord among the brothers. And that's in Proverbs 6.19. Or consider the Lord's prayer on behalf of his disciples and all those who would follow him, John 17. Jesus prayed his followers would show the world that he and the Father were one by being one among themselves. If Christians are to be true to our God in an accurate reflection of him to our world, then oneness must be a major item on our agenda. Those who cause division in the church over matters of power and control need to be confronted with the fact that their desire to rule at the expense of unity is a sin against the body of Christ. Believers who use legitimate differences or preferences or denominational distinctives to draw lines of separation in the body uh, sin against the very body they seek to protect. It is ironic that some of us in our zeal to keep the church pure end up polluting Christ's body with unwarranted divisions. But notice his concerns were those that do it for power and control and denominational distinctives. He goes on, but unity should not be pursued at all costs or at any cost. There is something more important than unity, and that is truth. We dare not sacrifice truth on the altar of unity. Christ made this clear in his prayer for his disciples. Before he prayed for their unity, he prayed that they be set apart in the truth that he taught them. Once they were firmly established in the truth, they could forge their unity in the truth they all affirmed. If Christians lose the importance of truth in the pursuit of unity, then we will eventually lose truth. Yet at the end of the day, all we have is truth. It is the truth that defines and guides all that we do and all that we are. Doctrines that biblically define salvation, Christ's deity and bodily resurrection, his virgin birth, and the infallibility and authority of Scripture are all non-negotiable. They are central to our faith. Attempting to unite spiritually with those who are not of the truth or promoting spiritual endeavors with them, in essence, uh, that the truth is, we say the truth is no longer important. And then he goes on and says he remembers talking to a, a well-meaning woman who's asked if he had ever prayed with a Mormon before. And he knew by the question that apparently she had. And so he asked, have you? And she said, yes. And, oh, and you know, I'd never done that before. It was a wonderful experience. It just felt such a unity and so forth. And uh, whatever she felt, you know, his point is, is that uh, uh, they, we can't have unity with people that are not of the same faith and are merely trying to, in some ways, mimic or imitate the faith because that's the very thing Jesus is warning us about. Let, let me ask you this question. How many of you know that, uh, that, uh, that Mormonism is not Christianity? Just Okay, that's pretty, pretty much most of you. Well, there's a, a noted author and preacher in our country who boasts to have the largest church in our country that apparently doesn't know that. Um, in an interview with uh, Chris Wallace and Fox News at uh, 12:23:07, Chris Wallace asked Joel Olstein, "And what about Mitt Romney? Is a Mormon a true Christian?" Joel Olstein quote, "Well, in my mind, they are. Mitt Romney has said he believes in Christ as his Savior, and that's what I believe. 
I'm not the one to judge the little details of it, so I believe they are. Romney seems like a man of character and integrity to me. And then goes on and talks about whether he would vote for him or not, which is not the point. <clears throat> if, you, if you've got a guy that uh, boasts to have one of the largest churches, which he does, uh, in, in the country, <clears throat> that hasn't even figured out that Mormons are not Christians. There's only a couple of possibilities, and none of them are flattering. I mean, he's either, either he's just an ap absolute heretic or he's stupid. And, and I don't think he's stupid. Do you, I mean, I've listened to the guy enough. I think he's pretty articulate. I think he knows what he's doing and what he's saying. Uh, what's, what's my point in, in, in all picking on poor brother Joel? Well, it's the whole point that Jesus said these are the things that would happen. That within the, the kingdom of God, he would raise up his church, the truth of his word, and Satan would come in and try to oppose it, certainly by externally, by, uh, by persecution. And that's a lot easier in some ways to see and realize it's happening and, and maybe to deal with. Uh, maybe what's more difficult is the corruption that would come like yeast, uh, the, the imitation of, of uh, uh, tares and wheats uh, together, uh, and the idea that uh, corporately the church could become so big as a corporation or world power, again, which it did from, say, the 15, uh, you know, 500 A.D. to about, a, you know, 1500 or so, uh, that actually uh, it just becomes uh, part of the corrupting influence and, and we miss the gospel. Again, Paul says there's counterfeit Christians, a counterfeit gospel, a counterfeit Jesus, and that's all going to prevent or be the opposition you know, again, Jesus doesn't go on and on and on for several chapters on this. He kind of hits it in eight little parables here, uh, and it seems to be the thrust of what he's seeing here. We need to be aware that there will be opposition to the kingdom of God, and it's going to come by primarily internal means uh, through, through Satan imitating the work of Christ. Secondly, uh, uh, those in the kingdom are obtained at a great price, verse 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So in, uh, in these two little parables, the first one, uh, those that come into the kingdom are like, are like hidden treasure. Uh, the man finds it, uh, he hides it again, and in joy, he goes and sells everything he has in order to purchase it. Now, uh, in Israel in that day, you wouldn't need to do that. If in Israel in that day, if you're walking through a field and you found some treasure there, ah, it's yours. <laughs> you, you didn't really need to go buy the field, you just, you just got it. So you had to kind of beware where you, where you buried your treasure. It's usually... <laughs> underneath your tent, underneath your house or whatever. It's not out in a field because if somebody else found it, it's theirs. So we have a very a different kind of a, a situation in this particular parable. Uh, a common interpretation of this parable is that uh, it's the sinner who's out looking and, and the treasure that he finds is the gospel in Jesus Christ. And in his joy, he sacrifices everything to have that gospel and have that relationship uh, with Jesus Christ. That's a common interpretation. Uh, I've got a couple of problems with it. One is that Jesus Christ is not a hidden treasure. He's probably the best known person in history. Uh, and secondly, a sinner can't find Christ in a sense because we're dead in our trespasses and sin. We really need the Holy Spirit to draw us to Christ. And third, we ain't got enough. <laughs> there's, there's nothing that we could sell or do to ever earn or attain the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. So again, uh, I, I really think that uh, uh, the person seeking is Jesus Christ, and we are actually the treasure uh, that he finds. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man to ke came to seek and save uh, that which was, uh, was lost. Notice also in the parable that he doesn't just purchase the treasure, he purchases the entire field. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. He didn't just die for the sins of the elect, as the Calvinists might say. Uh, even John Calvin did not believe that. And John 2, uh, 2 is pretty clear. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. 
Uh, it doesn't mean everybody in the world is going to be saved. But again, that's what we have in the parable here. Notice also that it was with joy that he went and sold everything. In terms of Christ going to the cross, the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, 2 says, uh, it was for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross despising its shame, despising its shame. But there was a joy, and that joy was that which was set before him, and that was you and I. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, uh, he had you and I in his heart and mind, and therefore it was going to be worth it, everything that he was enduring. And notice also it cost him uh, everything. When uh, uh, Christ left heaven, was born in a, a manger as a baby, had to live a perfect sinless life. He gave up everything in a sense in order to purchase us. We are a great treasure to, to Jesus Christ. We're the treasure hidden in the field. He finds it. He sells everything. He gives everything in order to, to save us, in order to redeem us. And the second uh, parable, I think, is like it. Uh, those who come into the kingdom are like a pearl of, of great price. And again, uh, when this pearl is, is found, uh, the person went away, sells everything so that he can purchase it. Uh, and, a, and again, this is a picture of what Christ does uh, for us. Again, a pearl grows gradually. The church has grown gradually as the Spirit convicts and converts the sinners. No one can see a pearl being make, uh, made. It's uh, in the oyster. It's in the ocean. Yet God is at work in our hearts and our lives and uh, internally. So there's opposition to the kingdom, but in the kingdom, uh, there are those that are obtained uh, at, a, at a tremendous price. Uh, the third thing is the message of the kingdom is to everyone. I know that's bad English, but it was the only way I could pull an O out of this one, so you just have to bear with me. Verse 47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down in the, to the lake, caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> so the message here of the kingdom is like, a, we'd say, a, a dragnet. Uh, uh, they fished a lot like uh, we fish here, uh, Peter and the guys. They, were, they fished line and hook off the shore like, um, like we do here and catch nothing. But, uh, but they, they were professionals. And remember the time that Jesus tells Peter, you know, go down and catch a fish, you know, to pay the, pay the temple tax and everything. And that's how he did it. Uh, at the same time, uh, they also used throw net, just, just like, uh, you know, guys do here. Yeah, it's the same, same type and everything. Uh, now, here we, we, uh, we lay net, you know, with the floaters on top and the, the weights on the bottom, and it's just out there overnight. You catch whatever coming in it. They, they used what's called a drag net between two boats. It was huge, and they just dropped it down like a giant scoop, and they just made their way around, and they just, you know, it's, it's like when you lay net, you get the... the the good, the bad, and the ugly in there, you know, and you got, you got to separate them later. I, said, <laughs> I always think of the camp out at Kualo again, <laughs> late in that, that night and uh, caught all of those, uh, what was in it? It was, uh, it was all the moy, that's right, yeah. It was unbelievable. But anyway, uh, uh, in that case, you got all really good fish. But uh, sometimes when you do that, you get all kind. But, and that's what's, what this parable is, uh, is about here. It's the dragnet, the one where it's just, they're going to catch anything that's uh, in the way of that net. And so they have to sit down and separate the good fish, the edible from the, the non-edible. Uh, and, uh, and he says that's how it will be at the, at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. Once again, we have the reference to the wicked being thrown in the fiery furnace where there, where there will be weeping uh, and gnashing and teeth. So the gospel uh, in this parable, the gospel is going to go out to the whole world. The whole world is not going to get saved, but, the, but they're going to have an opportunity. Uh, the, the gospel, like this net, is, is, is going to go out to everyone. It's not going to be discriminating. Everybody eventually uh, will, will hear the gospel or have an opportunity to respond to God. Again, even if they don't hear about Jesus personally, they have the witness of creation. They have the internal witness of their, uh, of their conscience. Uh, and at the end... Uh, uh, there will be this separation of true believers, false believers, good from bad, two kinds of people. Uh, and again, very clearly distinguishing those that are children of God, those that are children uh, of, uh, of the devil. Uh, do people pretend to be Christians? Uh, yes, they do. 
I, I, don't, uh, I don't think any of this by Jesus is meant to be alarming to cause people, man, I sure hope I'm saved. I don't know if I'm saved. Well, either you are or you aren't. And uh, if you're not sure, just come up afterwards and we'll pray with you so you can be sure uh, that you are. Uh, this is primarily talking about people who are really pretending. Uh, they know what they're, they're doing, you know, and, and again, there are leaders like that out there. Peter describes them in a second epistle, explains what they look like, what their motivation is, and everything else. Uh, so again, this is not to be discur- uh, discerning or dis- but up, but up, think of the right word. This isn't supposed to bum you out in terms of uh, whether you can be secure in your own salvation, uh, but it's supposed to make us aware of what's going to be going on during what we call the church age. Uh, again, opposition, uh, we're obtained at a great price. Uh, the message of the gospel is for everyone. We're not to be discriminating as we sow those seeds. We're to share with, uh, with everyone. Uh, there will be obligations, though, for disciples uh, of the kingdom, and we see that in verses 51 and 52. Uh, have you understood all these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore... Every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven, and here's another parable, <clears throat> is like an owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures uh, as well as old. So Jesus asked them, Are you, have you understood? And, uh, and again, it's, these guys really don't understand everything in a sense. I mean, they, they, they pretty much get the main idea here of these parables. Jesus has never mentioned the cross yet because the cross is not a subject until the kingdom is rejected. He's explaining about the kingdom. He still hasn't dropped the bombshell in terms of how this kingdom is going to be initiated through his death uh, on the cross. But at this point, to some degree, they, they respond. Uh, and the idea here is that understanding then brings uh, responsibility. First note that disciples are obligated to be like scribes or teachers who discover the truth. Uh, again, the, the teachers of the law in that day had been instructed, uh, you know, about the things of God. And now he takes that position and applies it to believers. Like the scribes, what did they do? They studied the word of God. They knew the, the, the word of God. They were able to bring out of the word of God, uh, like someone bringing treasure out of their home and showing them old things that we knew before, as well as new things that are being revealed. Those that come into the kingdom of God, this is not talking about a particular group of leaders, those that come into the kingdom of God, all of us, have an obligation. We have certain obligations. And one of them is to study God's word like we were teachers of the word of God, like we were scribes uh, in in this day. Uh, We have a responsibility to do that. And again, the scribes originally were a very noble group uh, that uh, went with Ezra back to help uh, rebuild the uh, the temple and and help hold to the teaching of uh, of the word of God. So as believers... We don't have to search after the truth because we have it in terms of God's son, God's word. We're taught by a spirit of truth and, uh, and it should be a joy as well as a privilege as we study God's word together. Two, uh, Timothy 2.15, Paul says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles uh, the word of truth. As a new believer, Peter says, like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Of course, there's also the warning from Hebrews. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. So it's possible to chronologically be a Christian for a number of years, but actually never grow up in our salvation. Uh, But certainly we want to heed uh, the idea that there's a responsibility that goes along with being a disciple. Secondly, disciples are obligated to do the truth. Uh, Again, the the scribe emphasizes learning, but a disciple emphasizes uh, uh, living. Ezra uh, Ezra is a great great example in the Old Testament, a a great what we would call expository teacher. If you uh, read read him, he would would read the scriptures and then explain what they meant and then read them and then explain them so that people could uh, apply them to to their lives. Ezra 7.10 says that Ezra devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees in Israel. He devoted himself to the study and observance. He studied it and he did it. 
<laughs> and then he taught it. And that's the, that's the formula that uh, uh, we're looking for uh, here. And then thirdly, disciples are obligated to dispense the truth. Uh, the idea of the owner of the house is a steward. He's been entrusted with these treasures. He's supposed to do something with the treasure. Bring them out, the old and the new treasures, dispensing uh, the truth. So there'll be opposition to the kingdom. It's obtained at a great price. It's for everyone. There's obligations. And lastly, there's uh, uh, limited opportunities as we get to this uh, last scene of Jesus entering Nazareth. Verse 53, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there, coming to his hometown. He began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, in his own house, is a prophet without honor. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. And again, uh, this is kind of bridged in here, somewhat out of chronological context to kind of make the point that Jesus is rejected as, uh, as the king. Uh, and therefore, because of what happens here, there's first we'd say that Jesus had li limited opportunities because they were offended. That word in verse 57, they took offense, is um, the word we get, uh, uh, our English word, uh, scandalon or scandalous. This was a scandalous thing. Because his life was scandalous. I mean, he's the guy that his mother is pregnant out of wedlock. I mean, these things don't go away in a little town and that, that culture. Mary lived with that her whole life. Uh, it's, you know, that's the reference. Is this the carpenter's son? You know, you know the couple I'm talking about. She's pregnant. They go away on a donkey, you know. I mean, after, you, know, you know, we know, we know, we got a word for this guy. That's, that's the implication. There, it's, a, it's kind of a slanderous thing that they're, saying they take offense it's it's uh, it's scandalous to him now in a previous visit to nazareth jesus goes in the synagogue he teaches and then uh, you remember the story he he takes the scroll of isaiah and he rolls it open to, to what we call uh, chapter 60 verse 1 obviously there's no chapter divisions uh, in a scroll and he says the spirit of the sovereign lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners and then he's, he closes, and he reads on a little more, and he closes the thing up. He's talking about the Messiah. He's come to proclaim the Lord, the day of God's favor. He rolls it up, he puts it away, and says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And it goes real big. And, uh, and so he, uh, he elaborates a little bit with two wonderful examples. Uh, one of the, uh, the widow of Zarephath, and how when Elijah goes into her town, uh, she has the faith to respond to the prophet and is blessed because of it. And by the way, uh, she's a Canaanite, a cursed group of people. Hey, there's a good example to bring up in the synagogue. Who's the other example he brings up? Naaman, a uh, Syrian. Syrian, you mean the people that killed and tortured us for a, a number of years? Yeah, those guys. The Syrians, remember Naaman, he comes in uh, to Elisha. He doesn't really, uh, he wants to be healed from his leprosy. Uh, he tells him to go dip seven times in the Jordan. He's, he's like, man, I, I can dip in a river back home. He heads off and then he gets convinced to go do it and then he's healed. So those are Jesus' two examples of what it means to respond in faith to the truth of God's word. Didn't go over real big. Took him out to a mountainside and wanted to throw him off and kill him. And he uh, basically walked through their, their midst and, uh, and took off. That was the last time he came to the synagogue. Uh, this would be the very last time there would be uh, any kind of a, a appeal uh, made to them. So he returns one final time. Uh, they ask this series of questions that tell us how familiar they are with him. Where does this man get his wisdom, his miracles? I mean, they've heard it. Uh, they realize what's going on. Uh, but they, they can't get over Jesus because he's too scandalous for them. People rejected Jesus Christ today for the same reason. The gospel is way too scandalous. You say that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him? That's way too scandalous. Uh, your gospel's got to be much more pluralistic. What about all the other good people? What about these other fine religions? You think you're more righteous? You think you're more sincere? That's scandalous, they would say to us today. <laughs> Don't shoot me, I'm only the messenger. 
It's what Jesus said. I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Uh, do, do you think people are real thrilled about the fact if they read a passage that if they don't receive Christ, they're going to burn in hell forever? P- people aren't real thrilled, uh, you know, hearing that. And they don't really, they think that's a, a scandalous thing. Uh, the gospel is a scandalous thing. People reject it for this very reason. That's, that's why it's here. Uh, secondly, there was limited opportunities because they had no faith in him. We see that in verse 58 because of their lack of faith. Uh, Jesus says in his own hometown, in his own house, a prophet is without honor. Again, his own brothers and sisters, um, uh, sorry, the, the, the ruffle the feathers of uh, Mary being a perpetual virgin, but uh, these are his brothers and sisters that are there. Uh, and, uh, and even them, you know, they, they reject him, uh, you know, at this point until after his death and resurrection in his own home in his own hometown he says a prophet is without honor his final visit and they reject him because of their their lack of faith it is interesting given the fact that he would always be referred to as Jesus of Nazarene and his followers would be called Nazarenes in the in the early church but uh, Nazareth did not receive him and Matthew fittingly closes with this little section on kingdom parables with this uh, event. I wanted to go through just uh, quickly seven things, kind of concluding thoughts of, of facts or uh, things that we learned from, from these uh, very important parables. One is the offer of the literal kingdom was rejected by a generation of Jews in Israel. It will be offered to a future generation of Jews in what we refer to as the end of the tribulation. And they will accept it. And Jesus will establish his kingdom and he will rule rule and reign from Jerusalem. What we refer to the millennial reign of Christ Christ for a thousand years. The church will already have been raptured and be with him during that period of time. We will come back with him at the establishment of that kingdom. Now the kingdom would come spiritually to those who would receive it by faith and apply it. Remember we saw that over and over again. The distinguishing thing between those that were not really saved and those were were the ones that heard it and it says with understanding that means they applied it it's not just belief it's belief plus trust again there there are those that you know misunderstand uh, that they believe that jesus is god come in the flesh they believe in the trinity they believe in the deity of christ they believe that jesus died for their sins and that's not enough they've never really applied it to their own lives personally uh, and, and that's a good thing if you meet somebody like that because you're on third base. A single gets a man. Even a, a hard hit ground ball gets a man from there. You know, No home runs. They're just, they're just right there. You just got to get them across the threshold so they can be born again of God's spirit, have a personal relationship with, uh, with him. Uh, the kingdom of God is now spread by individuals like uh, a farmer sowing seed. This power is in the word of God not in us. The power was in the seed, not in the person delivering it, yet we still have a responsibility uh, to deliver the word of God to those around us. The kingdom of God will be opposed by Satan. He'll take away words of the gospel from people's hearts as they hear it. He imitates Christians like tares among wheat, and he attempts to counterfeit the real thing. So we need to really be in prayer if we're going to see people come to faith in Christ. Somebody asked Charles Spurgeon one time what the secret was of his his, uh, tremendous ministry there in London. And he took him downstairs before one of the services. In the London Tabernacle, there was a basement. Uh, Thousands of people up there to hear him, crowding on the streets and outside listening through the windows. But he took him downstairs. And in the basement uh, down there in the dark, damp area were hundreds of people praying during every service. He goes... There's the power. That's why that's going on up there. That's why people, men and women, are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. It's not my words. It's what they're doing in the basement while I'm speaking. Prayer is so, is so critical. Uh, again, uh, people are either born again spiritually into the kingdom or they're not. There's no neutral ground. Uh, six, there'll be a judgment at the end of the age. Those who have not accepted the gospel of the kingdom will be punished forever. Sometimes people don't realize, why are you so adamant about telling people about Jesus? Why is it such a big deal? Because if they don't accept it, they will burn in hell forever and ever. That's why it's such a big deal. Again, I, I, you know, there's not a lot of preaching on hell. Uh, and uh, I don't know that it's all that effective, but I think believers need to hear about it. Uh, and I love... Uh, 
the um, Booth, the founder of the uh, Salvation Army, he, he, uh, he ran a, an evangelistic school and discipled these uh, men and women to be evangelists. And, and he said at the end, if he could have his way, <laughs> real eloquent guy, so if I could have my way, I would dangle them by their heels over the fires of hell for three days and three nights. And then I would yank them back. Then I would send them out to preach the gospel. I think that worked. I think that would work. I think uh, people would be a little more uh, focused on, uh, on, on the mission. Uh, seven, Jesus has given everything in order to purchase our salvation as if we were hidden treasure or the pearl of great price. And, and certainly that's something to, to meditate on and, and consider as well. I uh, mentioning uh, Spurgeon and, uh, and uh, William Booth. There's uh, another British... Uh, uh, kind of a famous story of a, a, a British church that was well known in, uh, in London that had a, a sister church that actually worked in the, uh, uh, in the inner city. And uh, once a year they would have a joint service together, which is kind of interesting because you have the upper echelon of British society now with all of the, all of the people that lived uh, basically in the, uh, in, in the ghetto or the slums of, of that day. And, it, and as uh, this pastor was closing the service, they had communion, and down on his right, he noticed two men praying, uh, kneeling side by side, praying together. One was a very well-known judge, and the other one was a very well-known burglar. And that judge had sent that burglar to jail at one time, and here they were, you know, praying side by side on their knees, taking communion together. And on the way out, he said to the judge, uh, did you notice who was kneeling next to you? He goes, oh, yes, I did. And the judge replied, it's a miracle of grace, isn't it? And the pastor said, yes, it certainly is. And he, he went on to say something about the other guy getting saved. And the judge said, no, that's, that's not what I mean. Uh, he, he says, it's, uh, he says uh, uh, it's not surprising that a burglar received God's grace when he left jail. He had nothing but a history of crime behind him. And when he understood Jesus could be his savior, he knew there was salvation and hope and joy for him. Uh, and he knew how much he needed that help. But look at me. I was taught from my earliest infancy to live as a gentleman, that my word was my bond, that I would to say my prayers, go to church, take communion, and so on. I went to Oxford. I obtained my degrees. I was called to the bar and eventually became a judge. I was sure I was all I needed to be, though, in fact, I was a sinner too. Pastor, it was God's grace that drew me. It was God's grace that opened my heart to receive Christ. I'm the greatest miracle. Not the burglar next to me. And it's really for all of us. It's, uh, we're the pearl of great price, the great treasure. God gave it all, and it's by his grace. And it's that message of grace that is the seeds that we're to go out and, uh, and share the with others. Amen. In the quiet Stillness you are there in secret in the quiet hour I wait only for you so I want to know you more in the secret in the secret in the quiet.
brothers and fathers in his sweet name to drown all our sins and come up again forever change never to return to the people we Never to return 